Welcome to the HCI family of podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Ellen Kane, welcome to the conversation today. Hi, John. Very nice it, to meet you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the Berkeley area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about your recent book, Fire Up Innovation, Sparking and Sustaining Innovation Teams. I love the title of your book, and I'm super thrilled to have a chance to sit down with you and to explore this together today. As we get started, I wanted to share Ellen's bio with everybody. Ellen Kane is author of Fire Up Innovation and is an innovation strategist, trainer, facilitator, and speaker with over 20 years of experience helping companies navigate innovation challenges. She's the founder and principal consultant at Fire Up Innovation Consulting, previously Strategic Insights, where she guides Fortune 500 companies, small, small businesses, and nonprofits to understand innovation, create innovative new products and services, build effective teams, and support a user-centered culture. Now, I could go on. There's a lot more to your background and your bio, but I'm going to pause there. Anything you would like to highlight by way of your background or personal context before we dive on it? No, oh, I think it's a good way to start. Thank you. Okay. Well, wonderful. When I'm sitting down with authors, one of the very first things I always like to ask is why this book? Why now? A book is a labor of love. It takes a lot of time and energy and commitment um, to put all of that experience, all those thoughts down on the page. Um, so why did you feel this this book was so important to get out there into the world now? So I studied creativity and I have um, a lot of books on creativity. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things I was joking with my roommate at the time when I studied at Buffalo State University is um, how to make it sexy. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I wanted to do is a book that has kind of represent me in the sense that it's both uh, anchored in research and mm -hmm. theories, but it's also super practical because uh, I think you know we can talk about innovation to death, and if we don't practice this, it's not going to be helpful. And I also didn't want a tool book because if you don't understand the basic of innovation, creativity, and the principle, then a tool doesn't really help you because it's like you know building a house if you have a bunch of tools but you don't know the principle of architecture, it's not going to help you. Yeah. Yeah. And then COVID I, hits and I had mm -hmm. more time. So it was the perfect opportunity to work on this book. Well, good. And that's as good enough of a reason as any. Uh, I know many people spawned all sorts of really great projects mm -hmm. during the COVID era. In fact, this podcast for me was a, pro a COVID project. I, I released my first episode May 8th of 2020, uh, you know, right, you know, a month and a half yes. after the lockdowns occurred. And, uh, and yeah, so it's been a labor of love for me. And I've, I've talked to so many individuals that either they, they started a new business or they launched a new product line, or they wrote their book, uh, in part due to, uh, the COVID period. And it was super disruptive. It was super hard for a lot of people. And I don't want to downplay that or diminish that, but it did also provide opportunities, uh, for, for people. Uh, and it's great that this book was able to, to come forth in part, you know, due to how you responded to that, um, that hard environment, that hard situation. So you've been working with companies, you know, in this innovation space for a couple of decades now. Uh, what first sparked your interest in working with innovation teams? How have things changed in the last couple of decades? Because I can only imagine, uh, you know, that with, with the, the, pace, the rate and pace of change in terms of technological advancements has just continued to like go up exponentially. Uh, so as we talk about innovation, I can only imagine that that's been a, a, a really interesting uh, dynamic space for the last couple of decades. Tell us more about that. Yeah. So um, 
And there's a lot of questions there. Uh, just my background, I did, I went to business school and then I wanted the most creative work I could do. And I work in advertising and I work on new products. And I just really loved that kind of the, the change and creating something new. So that's why I've been passionate about innovation for more than 20 years now. And uh, the changes is like, it's both change and doesn't change. <laughs> In the sense that in terms of organization, I see like a, a pendulum swing. Yeah, uh, at some mm -hmm. point, organization decide we need to create a innovation department or we're going to have this like startup within our, our organization. And they're going to just work on innovation and the rest of us is going to work on business as usual. And then when that doesn't work so well, then they're like, well, no, everybody has to work on innovation. And uh, we move it back and we cut that budget and everybody's working on innovation and that might not work so well. And then maybe we buy <laughs> a new company, you know, buying startup because we, we realize we have a culture that's not really helping. So we buy some startups and we integrate them and sometimes it's successful and sometimes not so much because the culture itself of, can kill innovation uh, from a startup. So it feels like nobody find the perfect solution. And so there is a lot of back and forth between those different models of how do we can we do innovation. Um, what I have to say is innovation is definitely a bigger word than it was 20 years ago. Uh, yeah. Like it's almost like a buzzword. I'm like, of course we want to be innovative. But what I found is a lot of the companies don't really know how. And mm -hmm. then you put it together teams uh, because of their skills, you know, their background, their, their technical skills, their um, specialties, but then they don't themselves know how to work on the innovation team because we don't train people about that. So uh, so we put the people for the skills, but then they have to work together. And that can be really challenging at times. Yeah. And amen to the buzzword piece. Yeah. Um, like I'm thrilled that more people are talking about innovation today than it seems was the case in the past. I, I think that's wonderful. Um, but if we don't get past the surface level and it's just buzzword, um, then that you know, first of all, what do you mean by innovation? So, right. And so lots of organizations start to use the terminology, uh, but are they really doing innovative things? Um, or is it more work as, as usual with a different framing? Um, and so that's part of the question, you know, that I have is, is if you've seen that shift as well beyond the rhetoric, like it more and more teams doing innovation better. Um, you've also, you, you identified the two main models and the pendulum kind of swings back and forth. Uh, I'm also curious to hear, you know, where do you think the right emphasis is, or is there somewhere in between that it should be and, you know, stop the big swings and have it, you know, in another way that could be more productive and, and create, create better outcomes for organizations. Uh, yeah, I think uh, first thing is, I think, uh, the world is changing really fast. Yeah, for sure. AI and other technology. So I think that everybody is going to be able, need to be able to adapt to the fast pace of change. And so even if your job as usual is not going to be the same job as usual in a year or two from now. So uh -huh. all of us need to be able to embrace that change and uh, for ourselves and for our team, even on the on a regular business, you know, we need to be able to embrace innovation. And then what does that mean in terms of the mindset? What does that mean about the tools? What does that mean about being more comfortable with trying new things and failing? And what's the culture is going to happen when we try this AI program and you know what, it's not great and we have to go to another one or we have to learn how to uh, do prompt engineering or all those skills. So I think at that level, we all need to be, um, we can't expect our job not to change in the next few years. So we, and then at the broader level, I think uh, there'll be some more significant changes that might need to be tackled by innovation teams. Um, and one of the things with innovation is you have to be consistent. And what I've seen sometimes is like, oh, we have an innovation, we give money to an innovation department or something, but two years later, we kept the budget. And that's not going to work because it takes time. And so if we're trying to get a very short-term return on investment, that might be challenging. On the other hand, you also need to have very clear criteria about what, what is innovation for us what does success look like? Which projects should be considered or not? So you'd need to really build a system when on the front end, you need to give 
freedom and opportunity to look at a lot of things. And then as you move things down the pipeline, there is a place when you say, this is not going to meet all $5 million a year goal, or this is not going to be feasible with a mission or something. So they have to be some clear, pro I'm a process person, and I believe that a good, clear process uh, can really be an enabler to successful innovation. So two things that you said there that I think are really important is the culture and the mindset around innovation, and then the processes, the systems um, to facilitate the innovation. Uh, I So getting beyond the buzzwords and starting to create an environment and a culture where you're promoting iteration, where you're promoting um, trial and error, and and no longer are you are you labeling things as failures because it didn't work. It's a learning opportunity. It's only a failure if you don't learn from it, um, and if you can't pivot rapidly to th then do the next thing. And so you know, fall forward, fail fast, iterate rapidly, try new things. Um, that's hard in a lot of organizational cultures because you know there's this punitive kind of. A mentality or like a fearful, you know, if I try this and it doesn't work, my job's on the line, or I'm going to miss out on that next promotion. And then people start to play it safe. And when people are playing it safe, you're not pushing the envelope and you're not innovating. And so that cultural shift, that mindset shift, I think is super, super important. You you touched on that, um, but also the processes and how, how can you start to build in to the systems of the organization, you know, stuff, uh, processes that really reinforce the mindset that you want your people to have uh thoughts on how we can go about doing that uh first we have to think about it uh to your point i think the culture is above so if the culture is not going to support innovation it's going to be killed you know yeah, you for sure. can train people i can coach people i can tell them everything and they're great at it but when they go up to management and the first thing that comes is like it's never going to work that's it the team is like i'm not going to try this so yeah. the cultures are the, definitely supporting. And then uh, really thinking about the process is not something that is sexy, back to that world, but it's so important. It's such a supportive element. And we don't necessarily think about success, uh, process. One thing that is both simple, but having good facilitators, having people mm -hmm. that are focusing on the process when the team is focusing on the content and often we just become a facilitator because you're either the manager on the team or you just been as assigned these things. But who is trained about good facilitation? And you see how meetings, just a simple meeting can be really bad. And then you add to a complex process of innovation. And unless you have um, you know, team members or external facilitator that really can focus on that, so then... It's an enabler to everybody else to be free and to think and to look at options. Uh, I think that is um, really important. Um, and then the and then changing our perception of risk. Uh, we all we often talk about the risk of failing and the cost, mm -hmm. but we should also be looking about the risk of not of of the cost of not taking risk. Yeah. And we assume the risk of the risk of stagnation, right? Yeah, and business as usual in the world that is changing so fast is going to be like, it's likely that your business is going to go down. So in a, in a way, innovation is not a choice and you have to embrace mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah, that that risk of stagnation and the risk of just being irrelevant. You know, if you don't keep up with the the pace of change and you're not adapting and pivoting and and, and being agile, you're just going to increasingly become irrelevant. You're going to lose market share. You, your products and services aren't going to be as good as your competitors. You're not going to attract and retain the best people. Uh, and it just becomes this like downward spiral. Exactly. <laughs> if, if, if you, if you can't maintain that kind of a, of a culture, at least where you're trying to innovate, like nobody's perfect and you're not always going to be perfect at innovation. You're not going to be perfect with the mindset. You're not going to be perfect with the processes, but you can reinforce those things in such a way that it gives you a much better chance of, of having consistency in the, the innovative juices that are flowing within your team and within the organization. Um, it, and it's not always going to be a home run. You're going to fail more often than you succeed in terms of like traditional failure and success. Um, not everything's going to work, but if, if you can create that kind of psychologically safe environment where people can try stuff, where they can experiment on stuff and iterate rapidly, 
uh, then you're, you're going to have far more interesting solutions to the problems that your organization faces. You're going to have far more interesting potential products and services that you're, that are going to be more valuable to the market, to your, your clients. Exactly. And I think it's really important what you say about prototyping and testing and do it early. I mean, that's for me is a, is that because in corporate, we want to be perfect. So we're not going to get something out even to our management or to users before we feel like it's good is good enough. Mm -hmm. But I really challenge team and saying, when this is might be good enough when it's really rough. And let's to get it out as soon as possible, get some feedback as soon as possible. So at a point that is cheap and fast, uh, rather than waiting another six months to fine tune everything. So get things out when they're messy and they're rough. Actually, you might get better feedback because nobody's feeling, it's going to think they uh, offend anybody with a feeling on something that looks like a, something you draw in five minutes. And so it's a prototyping and testing fast and iterating again and again and again as a learning opportunity, as you mentioned, rather than at that point, we're not going to try to measure our number, we don't know if that project is 5 million or 20 million, but are people excited right. about it? Do they get it or they don't? That's information you can get really early on and that's really helpful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and part of, I think, this this in, the innovative kind of mindset and the culture is also built around diversity, uh, in my experience. Um, yes. have, having a more diverse team, having people with different backgrounds, different experiences, different worldviews, um, different expertise, different skill sets, cross pollinization, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary work teams, you know, that is some of the secret sauce, I think, to innovation. Um, can you tell us more about why team diversity is such a big focus in your book and, and how we can go about, you know, thriving in a more diverse environment, understanding that, yeah, it can be challenging, you know, Putting together diverse teams can be challenging. Sometimes managing diverse teams can be challenging. But if you want innovation, you know, it's it's part of the, the secret sauce there. Exactly. So the reality is it's harder to work people that are not like us. It's harder to do it. But that's really what's important because we're trying to solve complex problems. Yeah. They have multi-aspect to the solution. And so if not everybody's in the room, then we might miss a key aspect of the, the solution or the ideas that we'll discover much later when, oh, we need to talk to the finance person, or we need to talk to that manufacturing person and mm -hmm. realize that we can't make this thing, or it cost us 20 million, or all of those. Uh, and so having as many people from different perspective in the room uh, early on a project can really uh, identify um, issues. Uh, find solution that might come from a uh, perspective that you would not think about. Because one of the things about innovation is we often think about it's innovation in product or services or experiences. Mm -hmm. But actually, innovation can be in anything else. It can be yeah. in pricing. It can be in the way we communicate, is who we partner with, different way to make the product. And so if the people that are, have those kind of functions are not in the room, we're just going to get another product and services and maybe that's not the answer. Or maybe it's only a piece of the innovation is only that that new product services component, but it needs to have all those elements integrated up front to really create a new, a new innovative business model. Yeah. So you can have innovation around processes, around efficiencies. You can have innovation around quality control, innovation around every last piece of the business. Exactly. <laughs> um, can be innovated. That's a really important point uh, to, to emphasize. So I, I appreciate that. Um, all right. So as, as we're thinking more uh, about how to do this effectively, um, what have you seen as like some of the biggest roadblocks, the biggest setbacks for organizations, despite maybe their intention, despite maybe their aspirations around trying to become that really great innovative organization with an innovative culture? I mean, it's it's a, the culture is one of the biggest roadblock. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, I mean, something that's really helpful is having a team champion, uh, kind of protecting the team, especially early on when it's kind of we don't know where we're going, and you know, it might be kind of weird idea or different direction. Is having a way to kind of protect the team when they kind of the baby step, <laughs> you know, those little seeds and can let them play in a way that can be really um, really helpful. 
Uh, but another thing that is uh, totally on the other side, but it's surprising me sometimes not so clear is what are the criteria for success? Be clear, we set them up and up front. Um, so as we move forward and as we especially evaluate pieces of this is what problem should we work on or what idea should we select versus we come up with a hundred, that's easy, but which one do we select? Uh, having decisions that are made with very clear criteria in mind um, that what is important, how is it in, in, in line with a mission, how is it in line with a value proposition, how does it fit with a customer's need, thing like that. And so that can really be helpful. And sometimes you, and it's okay to have constraints. Uh, you know, I learned that design your yeah. love constraints. It's easier to design within constraints. So is this something a management has in mind about something or it's important to be upfront. It's actually helpful. There's a play we want to be free, but it's also important to have clear criteria about how is a project will be able to move forward, what's important, what's less important. So we don't judge idea on what we like or what we're excited about, but on, you know, how is it going to, what does this organization want as moving forward with the innovation projects? Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's one of those tensions because you know you have your your mission, you have your vision, you have your values, you have your your core strategy as an organization, and you want to have congruency and alignment. Um, but on the other hand, you want to innovate, and some sometimes that innovation means you're going to end up possibly going in completely different directions, right? And yeah. so finding ways that you can ensure you know, alignment and consistency with mission of, of the organization while leaving open the door for new opportunities without completely flooding your your teams with like endless possibilities because there are endless possibilities when we're talking about innovation literally yeah. it could be anything and you don't you can't chase everything you can't throw every last piece of spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks you do have to make choices you do have to prioritize um so what, what have you seen you know how, how can we help um, leaders navigate that tension around you know alignment and st strategic um consistency versus you know really trying to foster this environment where people can pitch new kind of wild crazy ideas even sometimes and try different things that maybe we'd never thought of before i mean that's where you have a great uh, leaders that have a vision and kind of see what's what's uh, what's the range of uh, you want to give to your teams uh of let's play and you can go wild and at some point it needs to be, and it could be, you know, we give you play time and budget time for a year, but in a year we want an MPV and we want to have some customer yeah. feedback or something. So there is kind of some roadmap that you can do. I, I hate the funnel concept because mm. I'm just assuming that uh, innovation is uh, has a very nice linear path, which it doesn't because it's messy up and down. Yeah. But yeah. Having some, some framework for the team to play and know kind of what, what their playground area is, I think is really important. And it takes some um, strategic decision. It takes some, sometimes it's like a leader's willing to say, hey, you know what? I'm willing to lose on these projects because that's a learning experience and we need to do that. And we should actually celebrate failure and things like that. But I'm not willing to lose more than 5 million on this. So think like that. So be clear, yeah. I think it, Ambiguity is not good. If it's like, oh, we'll just play and we'll let you know later, that's very uncomfortable. But if we like, okay, you can play to this point within those criteria and then we'll review and then we decide what's the next space we, we're willing to open for that project or say, you know, that's not going to work for us. And and it should also be managed as a portfolio. So it's not like one innovation. It's like we have a portfolio and then we can also evaluate those potentially the potential new ideas against each other too, uh, once again with clear criteria. So usually there is, you know, you you start with a lot and then you kind of see well to get to the stage two when you need more funding. This is some things, and we might have ten projects, and we have to decide the three that we're willing to take forward for organization. I, I like that idea of putting some criteria and some structure around the play, so you allow openness, freedom. Um, for people to try 
all sorts of things within a certain sphere, right? So you do put criteria around it. I think that can really be helpful because it can also be overwhelming to an individual if you just say, hey, go create the next amazing, brilliant thing. You know, <laughs> no, 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 no constraints at all. Um, some people can do that, but, you know, most teams are going to do better if they have at least some level of understanding around what constraints they're trying to work within. Um, and, and then, you know, having freedom to play with the, with the criteria, I think is excellent. Um, Ellen, I note the time. This has just been a great conversation, but I also need to let you go in just a minute. Before we wrap things up, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, uh, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Okay, so um, so you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on my site. Uh, it's fireupinnovation.com. Uh, and then you can find more information about my book. Uh, on the website, you have a you can download a sneak peek or you can just directly to wherever you buy your books and um, buy it. Um, I have a Kindle and a paper version. The paper version I recommend because there's a lot of graphs and exercise in the book. And you can learn more about my services. And I would love to, I always love to talk about innovation. So feel free to reach out to me and we can have a 30 minute conversation. And the last word is um, just try new things. Mm. Um, try it for yourself today. Just do one thing that you haven't done. Be uh, taking a different road uh, on your bike or uh, sign up for a class or something because innovation is really a mindset ultimately. So, and by doing it to, for yourself, you will be able to bring that to your organization as well. Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much, Ellen. It's just been a pleasure. Yeah. I encourage the audience to get connected, find out more about what Ellen can do for you, check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe, and please join us again soon.